In 1981, 82.4% of the educa local education was funded provincially by the province. That dropped to 64.8% by 2000, and it's currently at 58.8% for 2020. The municipal government, which um, is our local spe um, special levy, was 33% in 2000, and in 2020 was 37.6%. So it's picking up some of where the province is as a beginning. And since school boards are no longer permitted to tax local property owners for increased education costs, this was a big reason for us. Property assessments in our area have gone up considerably over 20 years. Urban farm residential has gone up three times, farmland and buildings 4.9 times. Our special levy has gone down, down, obviously because our property assessments have gone up. And uh, if you look at the same time period, the school division's education costs have only gone up 1.83 times. Just so you know, since it was in the media about the uh, cost of administrators and various other things, we have a very clear uh, administration costs. So in 20 years, 20 years ago it was 3.2% of the overall budget. In 2020 it was 2.49% of our overall budget. At the same time, salaries have gone from 80.9% of our total expenditures to 84.4% of our expenditures. Partial Prairie's cost of students has historically been very reasonable, always being far below the provincial average, usually by about $1,300 per student. Elections for trustees are coming up this fall. If you're interested in being an advocate for 
Education in our area, please pass the budget money. Trustees make roughly $8,000 a year, and there has been no increase since 2014. All provinces in Canada have publicly funded education systems, and local citizens have always had a voice in shaping the educational system in our area. Over the past 20 years, trustee expenses have dropped from 0.5% of expenditures to 0.4% of expenditures. Innovative and responsive initiatives developed by the Port Prairie School Division. Installing fiber optic cable in Port Prairie and out to Oakville School was a huge improvement to being connected to the web and projects like this wouldn't be possible now. We are viewed as a leader in the province. We offer a variety of career development education courses that enhance the employability skills of our students. The roving campus gained national attention designed for disengaged youth near graduation who struggle to attend classes for a variety of reasons. The students enrolled in campus earn credits through participation in rich learning experiences, lessons that address barriers to learning and support achievement. The program partners with Portage Community Revitalization Corporation and is supported by $100,000 in grants. The results are promising, and teacher coach James Kostichuk has many positive outcomes to share. Another program developed by Portage Prairie School Division and now emulated across the province is the mandatory career development in grade 9, which opens up opportunities and options in grades 10 to 12. Career development coordinator Mr. Bordeski assists students with apprenticeship programs. Students gain real life experiences and credits leading to graduation. These graduates become our leaders of tomorrow. Here is an example of some of the vocational credits earned in the automotive program, carpentry, early childhood education, applied commerce, air styling, photography, early childhood education, credits for employment, career development internship, high school apprenticeship, and healthcare aid. Local voices have made local choices resulting in huge benefits to our students. We're, we are somewhat concerned with the province going to centralized um, funding, that they may choose to go with an average for all students, and this is a concern of ours. So there was this research done in the early 1950s in the USA, where they took measurements from 4,063 pilots when they were aiming to build uh, cockpit for fighter pilots on the average of these measurements. They then found out that if they went to the average measurements, these cockpits would fit no one. The flaw of averages, it was called. Gilbert Daniels' findings were clear and incontrovertible. There was no such thing as an average pilot. If you have designed a cockpit to fit the average pilot, you have actually designed it to fit no one. So we really hope that the average isn't what's used in the funding of education. The 2022-2023 budget has an anticipated expenditure of $44.06 million, an increase of over $2 million from 2021-22. The budget shortfall is a reduction of expenses of $473,000, increase in revenue of $350,000, Staffing reductions of 318,000, shortfall budget of 300,000. That makes up our 1,441,000 shortfall. We have relied heavily on our capital reserve funds for the past four years, and they have been exhausted. If you're ever curious about how dollars are spent in our or other school divisions, check the Manitoba Free Report for Education. It's available online and goes back many years. For a more in-depth look at the many things Portage Prairie School Division does, check our website, www.plpsd.mb.ca. Under Board and Governance on the far right-hand side, then click on the Division Report slash Plan, and under the Continuous Improvement Divisional Report 2021-2022, you will learn all kinds of things that our division does and the, the goals that they have set. Will our demographic needs be factored into provincial funding so we can help all students achieve the best of their abilities? 
Um, actually, we were on the call yesterday when we were presenting to the province because we do want to make sure that they consider our demographics. Children living in low income families in 2016, the percent of children aged 17 and younger was 30.2% in the city of Port La Prairie. That is of concern. Vulnerable children on the EDI in Southern Health 2015 and 2019, the percent of kindergarten children vulnerable in one or more domains. In 2019, that was 44.3% in the city of Port La Prairie. So we really want to make sure that those needs are addressed. Delivery of education is constantly evolving. Due to health protocols in the past two years, our schools have found ways of doing things that they will keep as well. Staggered lunch hours and recesses, coming in different entrances so that there isn't the same congestion, washing hands better. Remote, remote learning does have benefits for some of our students. And in-person learning is still, most often, the best mental health for mental health and building social skills. Because we're in a rural community, busing is a huge portion or a big consideration for our budget as well. We have 20 regular routes, bus routes from Hopeville for home ec and shops courses. And last year, they traveled 592,000 kilometers, transporting 1,051 students. We need them to be in good working order for the safety of our students. Our oldest bus is 2006. It is a spare. Oldest on a route is from 2012. We aim to buy one to two buses every year to keep the rotation and keep them nice and working order. The bullet bin example. If we aim to educate all students, we need to aim to be successful in reaching those with the biggest challenges. Light and bowling to get a strike in order to knock down all the pins, you need to aim for the pins that are hardest to hit, not just the easy ones. Our students benefit from many different subjects and learning opportunities <coughs> in their individual and community interests. These opportunities are essential for preparing them for a life beyond the classroom. Orange Prairie School Division has historically been a responsible for spending local tax dollars conservatively and effectively. Our goal for everyone is a wonderful graduation. We are hoping and looking forward to a more normal graduation celebration for our students this year. We are all about removing barriers. Thank you very much. And do you have any questions? Thanks for the presentation. Uh, you said that the budget was made in mind to reduce the impact on classrooms as much as possible. What impacts were there on the classrooms? What is which? What impacts on the classrooms were unavoidable? Mm -hmm. We, um, you know, we were concerned at the outset of uh, the planning that we may have to reduce uh, instructional staff, like teaching staff. Fortunately, that wasn't part of our, our you know, the end result. So I think the board's um, priority was to ensure that classroom sizes remained low and teachers remained in the classroom. So that's that's one of the you know, successes, I could say, of this budget. I think they were really aware of the, the, the concerns of post-COVID and the needs of students as we come out of COVID, um, mental health concerns, uh, academic uh, concerns, and so we've been able to address that by not having to cut staff, teaching staff, and uh, maintain our lower class sizes. It's sure great to see you guys all up here. So when you say that you aim uh, at reaching those with the biggest challenges, when you say that you aim, aim at reaching those with the biggest challenges, what do you mean by that? Um, it says you know, about being removing barriers, being all inclusive, and quality, equity, and inclusion. And so, when you talk about budget and then setting aside the budget to, or most all the students, all the students should have the same opportunities, right, or afford the same opportunities and afford the same resources. So, when you say that you aim at reaching those with the biggest challenges, what kind of challenges are we talking about? No. The, 
there's many, there's poverty, there's physical disabilities, there's mental disabilities, there's any, anybody at risk. As a board, we've been informed and told that with COVID, we have a large number of kids who are behind. Some kids who are, you know, because it's been two years, two and a half years, they're that far behind in, in their work. We know that there are some places where they have decided that, hey, we're going to um, actually hold all these kids back. We hope to be able to put in enough resources and continue to put in resources so that we can bring kids up. It's not going to be easy, but we think that with the budget that we have and with not cutting frontline staff, that it's going to help. Is it fair to say that some of these challenges can be related to mental health because of COVID? Absolutely. And that's something that is very difficult for any school division to do. That really, should really be a provincial concern. Yvette mentioned that yesterday we did a presentation to the people that are looking at the new funding model. And that was one of the main things, that, one of the things, not main, one of the things that we stressed was the fact that mental health has to be dealt with. We have to have more money or better resources from other places like health to deal with, with mental health problems. Okay. Yes. No, when I was on the board, we were dealing with large numbers of students in certain schools and with the additional factors that have come in. How are we dealing with the overcrowding of our schools being overcrowded or is there anything? Well, we've had classrooms built since you were on. I, I understand that. I know that. But I'm just wondering how are we doing on that? Well, we're, we're very close. We are uh, getting to our limits again of space you know, in, in classrooms, but um, we have an eye on it and we're just keeping, it's, it depends how the development in Port of Prairie happens or not as well. So and we have had discussions with the, the city as to about possibilities, but right now all we can do is keep our eye on it. It would help if we knew well in advance of what's happening. That um, development that's going on up by Walmart, um, those are three bedroom apartments from what I can read. Um, who's going to be moving into there? And where are they going to be going to school? Yeah. And that's something that Dave, we couldn't plan for because we didn't know. And even if we could plan for it, we're not sure. We know that the province's answer right now is portals. Um, you know, we, we've seen that. Uh, we want to get kids back into the classrooms, into their own classrooms, as much as we possibly can without the crowd. Well, I just seen the RM making an announcement the other day that they're selling another chunk of land for another factory up there. Well, that's bringing more families in. And I know we were almost at Bolton when I was on the board four years ago. How are you guys? Have you got any plans to address this in the future? We found out about that the same day we did. I know, that's the problem. We have, of course, the problems. Anybody else? We're pleased that we did not make staff cuts. In fact, if anything, we would probably have to reinstate some positions. And we knew that, especially at the high school level, that that needed to be done. Uh, and that's built into the budget. Nobody's going to ask, I see so many uh, teachers and administrators, about raising for next year. <laughs> Well, you know what the answer would be? No, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. That's usually a question that it comes. Yeah. 
Yes, this is a budget meeting. Where is the paper with the budget on it? Like, where are the numbers? Show me the numbers. Just the, uh, the slide about the shortfall. Pardon? This, the, the one slide about the shortfall. And we're yeah, but in the past, you've had numbers like, you know, you've spent this much for the last five years on buses and salary and gas and infrastructure, and this is what your priorities are for the next year. I don't really feel we see it. You know, there wasn't really a whole lot of room for us to make changes anyways. And they're very, very minimal. So. Part of that is the fact that the last year or two years, it's been virtual. And, uh, you know, we didn't come up with paper copies of things. And as you had said, um, the budget hasn't changed very much. May change in itself. And but it is just that it's a guideline. Yep. Yeah. And we've been, I mean, for the last three, four years, we've been just cutting and cutting and cutting, so it's very, very slim. Thank you. Saving paper costs, too. Pardon? Saving paper costs. Chris, how did uh, the increase or changes in funding compare with the uh, Jonathan, the U.S. Uh, increase in the How much short of inflation was it, do you know? It's hard to say. We did get some one-time funding from the province uh, for the upcoming for this year and for the upcoming year. Um, and again, so that was to cover some inflationary costs plus some of the increases for salary. Um, but the exact increase, again, is hard to just tell. Again, we're still trying to manage what the inflationary costs are coming. We are told for next year that a lot of our costs, like our insurance costs, you know, hydro's going up, you know, fuel's going up. Okay, so yeah. we're ignoring this year then for the last three years, because we know the inflation rates for the last three years. How close was it? How close was funding? Yeah. The funding in the province this year was about 2% increase. So again, it's trying to manage what we have, and again, we need to cover our costs. Sorry, cost of living was, was established in the negotiation at 3.3. So the cost of living increment is 2%. So yeah, there was a shortfall. This year, yeah, that's, that's what you're asking. I know over four years, the teachers actually got less than the cost of inflation because the first year was 2.5% uh, inflation, but the teachers got 1.6. So I'm just wondering, over those four years that you cited, the increase in wages, how much that matched up with the inflation rates of funding increase? They only matched inflation for three other four years of their wage increase. And the funding has not matched inflation. Anything else?
Yes. I have a question. Sort of education, but you can do that. I have a comment or suggestion for that. Maybe that? Yep. Where do we get this from here? Oh. Big green green now? Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> if you would if you would do a, you know send that in to yeah. us, we'll we'll gladly take okay. it. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Thank you for coming. Drive carefully with the call before we get